So my name is um, Stephen Chin. I'm the Java community manager um, and also a Java developer. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, doing Java on the Raspberry Pi and how to do some 3D printing and a little bit of performance tuning for the ARM processor. Um, and this is my day job. So I'm the Java community manager and I manage, um, we run, um, we, we help with user groups worldwide. So there's over 300 user groups worldwide. So who, who here is a user group member? Okay, so who, who is a user group member? <laughs> Everyone should raise their hand because you're at a user group meeting. Yes, very good. Okay. So, um, where, where's our stickers? Oh, yeah, yeah, here. Okay, so, who doesn't have a sticker yet? Uh, you don't, you don't have a sticker. So, what, what user group do you belong to? Very good. All right, <laughs> sticker. Okay, so I'm I'm slightly here. Here you go. I'm I'm slightly easier at stickers than Sebastian. Um, okay, there's also worldwide nine million Java developers. So, um, who's a Java developer in the room here? Oh, oh, a few Java developers. Okay, so so what Java technology do you use? Yeah. Java applets, oh, very good, very good. We're gonna talk about Swing and JavaFX in a bit. So you're in the right place. Okay, sticker. Um, there's 150 different Java champions in the world um, and it keeps growing as more people get added to the Java champion group. Java champions are an advocacy program for folks who speak and talk about Java champions. I used to be a Java champion and then I, I made the mistake of joining Oracle so now, now I'm an alumnus instead of a Java champion. Um, but does anybody know the name of a Java champion? Uh, oh, oh, you don't have a sticker. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very good. <laughs> Yochi Sakuraba. Okay. Sticker. Um, okay. And there's also 50 different... Java user groups contributing to the JCP. Um, does anyone know what the JCP stands for who doesn't have a sticker? Yeah, you have a sticker. You can't. No, 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 no answer. Yes, that's, that's a good trick. But nobody can see your shirt. Okay, so let's do an easier question. What do you, what do you think the J in JCP stands for? Anyone? Who doesn't have a sticker? Oh. oh, you don't have a sticker yet. What's what do you think the J stands for? Yeah, yeah, J. Very good. <laughs> sticker. Okay. So Java community process. This is how the specs get created for um JAXRS, which you guys were just talking about. Um Java EE, Java SE9, and they all go through the um Java community process. But we're gonna chat about something. I think is even harder than all the community work, which is um, game emulation. So in the US, um, we got the NES, the Nintendo Emulation System. In Japan, you guys got it first, and it was the Famicom. So did anyone have a Famicom? Oh, a few people. OK, so in the back, what, what's your favorite Famicom game? Yeah, yeah. Mario. Oh, very good choice. <laughs> I like Mario too. Uh, do you have a different game you like in the blue shirt? What's your favorite game? <laughs> what, what did you say? I, I 
Oh, okay. So that must be like a simulation? Nobunaga? Oh. Very, very serious, man. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I think somehow that game didn't get ported to the U.S. Perhaps. Perhaps. Yeah. But Mario, we have in the U.S. <laughs> Um, okay, so there's over 826 different ROMs for the Nintendo emulation system that were created, and um, a bunch of homebrew games, so people are still developing games for the NES hardware um, and releasing them for free. The, the hardware itself was a, a Motorola-based 68,000 processor um, produced by Rico. Um, so they created a clone of that, and um, to accurately emulate the NES hardware, you need to emulate the CPU, the pixel processing unit, or PPU, and the audio processing unit, or APU. And there's 92 million synchronization points per frame. So it's very, very hard to do, and computationally intensive to do the, um, the emulation if you want to be accurate. Um, so of course, you know, doing all this, you have to test and make sure it works with different games. So I had to spend a lot of time doing very difficult testing. Anyone recognize this game? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Ninja, uh, Ninja, okay, you have to help me with this because I can't say it in Japanese. How do you say it? Ninja Dukenden. Dukenden. Ninja Rukenden. No. Lu? Do Kenden. Dragon? Do? Okay. Ninja, do. Ken? Ken, den. Ninja, do Ken, den. Okay. All right. So this game's very, very hard. Did you beat it? Oh, oh. So I think this is in like the top five hardest games on the on the Famicom. Very difficult. And when you turn off the power, you start from the beginning. <laughs> so you have to leave on your console for many weeks to beat this game. Um, how about this game? Oh, so so I think everyone knows what was it. Ruckman. Okay, sticker. <laughs> okay, okay. So I, I heard some folks say it, but in, in the U.S., they called it Mega Man instead of Ruckman. So they changed the name for some reason. And also, I think they, they skipped some versions of Ruckman. They didn't port to the U.S. until later they re-released them for in archives. But they kind of, they like skipping games to port. Okay, how about this one? Oh, it's easy, it's easy. Huh? <laughs> Did I hear somebody say it? <laughs> no. Gradius, very good. Okay, sticker. <laughs> okay, this is actually a, I think this is a super Famicom game, not a Famicom game. But, you know, once you play all these games and shooters and, you know, do all this hard work, very, very difficult work, then you get to, to Nirvana on gaming and you, um, you discover this. <laughs> okay, so who, who knows? Oh, oh, Konami Code. Okay, good. So, because you're a gaming expert, we're gonna we're gonna have a challenge. Challenge. Okay, so I've got I've got <laughs> a gaming console for you, and we're gonna pick your favorite game. We're gonna play Mario. Yeah, the first one, Super Mario. Well, I guess technically not the first one. Okay, so you you get that gaming console, and I'm gonna get an even better gaming console. It's called NetBeans. Yeah, it's a pretty good <laughs> gaming console. I would I would highly recommend it. So this is the um 
Um, same source code running on desktop and Raspberry Pi. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a, a speed run through the first level of Mario and see, see, who's, see who's faster. Okay, so you want to count down for us, Sebastian? So, so, so you ready? All right. Go. Go. All right, let's get going. Oh, keyboard buttons get stuck. No oh, good. Oh, now I'm big. Now there's a secret. Got to get the one-up mushroom. Uh-oh, you died? Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, oh this is the, the magic one with the... Oh no. So this actually, this is complete cheater because on the, on the later games, you at least go to be a, um, a big Mario from fire. But the original one, you lose all your power-ups. That's not, that's not fair. I think that's cheating. Ah! <laughs> okay, I died. But see, I, I get to start halfway, so I'm going to catch up to you. Ah! Almost there. Oh, oh. Game over. <laughs> All right. So, unfortunately, you you lose the challenge, but um, give him a round of applause for being a good sport and playing. So, thank you. And pass the game console around. So you guys should try a little bit and then pass it to the next person to try. Okay. So what you guys are are looking at, it's a um, homemade console. So the, the case is a custom 3D model that's um, printed on a kind of a home, home 3D printer. Um, the electronics, so the touch screen and the Raspberry Pi, they're all, um, put together by hand and it's running full Java software. So the same um, emulator I showed you guys in NetBeans is what I deploy to the Raspberry Pi and run on it. Okay, so first a little bit about the, the hardware. So who, who has a Raspberry Pi? Ah, 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 okay. So, so in the back, what, what, have you done anything interesting with your Raspberry Pi, any projects? Not yet, not yet. Okay, that's an honest answer. You get a sticker <laughs> for being honest. How about you? Did you do any cool projects? Oh, you have yours with you. Oh. Raspberry Pi 2. Very good. Sugoi? Is there any cool projects you do? Oh. Very good. Very good. That's cool. Okay, sticker. Sticker for... Um, Yes, so the Raspberry Pi is really cool. You can do lots of interesting things with it. The um, GPIO pins let you hook it up to electronics. So it's very good for hooking up to like um, sensors. You can get like wired um, sensors for like when doors open and close. You could do accelerometers to tell the orientation of things. Um, temperature sensors, all sorts of, of fun little toys. And then you can access that from the software it's an ARM-based processor that you can run Java on. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 2 is uh, 900, 900 megahertz, maybe. Raspberry Pi 3 is 1200, maybe. I forget. Anyway, it's fast. And the 2 and the 3 are quad-core. The Raspberry Pi 1 is single-core. Raspberry Pi B plus is single-core. Um, you get a screen, and you also get a SD card, which is the um, hard drive for it, and you power it off micro USB. So, anybody know what these two are? 
these two ports on top. Oh. Oh, so I, I know the one person in the room who does know the answer is too busy playing Mario. Oh, what, what do you think they're for? Yes, very good. Sticker. Well, another sticker. Uh, how about the other one? Okay, so I think we need a we need a hint. I'm gonna borrow. Okay, who doesn't have a sticker? Who, somebody who doesn't have a sticker, tell me what this is. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, in the black black shirt. What do you what what's this called? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, good sticker. <laughs> Display, very good. So the one is for a Raspberry Pi display, so you can hook up a little touch screen, LCD screen. Um, the other one is for the camera. You hook up a little pinpoint camera. Do you use this in your home automation system, the Pi Cam? Or oh, okay, you have Pi Cam, so you've, you've used this. Um, the display, unfortunately, the one for the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a little bit big. It's seven inches. So for the RetroPi, I chose a different display type um, using a different interface. And these are the other display interfaces you can use on the Raspberry Pi. So you can use a composite. Um, composite's the old RCA jacks, and it's relatively low quality. Um, and also, you have to have a back converter from the um, to go back from the RCA back to or composite back to um, LCD, which consumes power on an embedded device. HDMI is much better. It's better quality output from the Raspberry Pi. Um, I would recommend this if you're hooking up your Raspberry Pi to a TV or a monitor at home. Um, but for a small device, you need a back converter board, which goes from HDMI to the LCD signal. So that's um, a little bit of extra power. You can hook up some displays support SPI, which is a serial peripheral interface. Um, SPI is good quality, but it's very slow because the, the bus is designed for hooking up electronics, um, like, like things which interface with the Raspberry Pi. If you send display data over it, you only get about 10 to 15 frames per second. So for the um, NES emulation, we need 60 frames per second to be accurate, to have full frames. And the last one is device tree support. So device tree support is a, it's a little bit of a hack, but basically what you do is you, you upload a device tree file to the boot sector and you remap the GPIO pins to be LCD pins. And this board from Adafruit is called the Kippa, and what it does is it maps the GPIO pins to an LCD header, and that way you can directly use any touch screen with the Raspberry Pi. Um, so it's, it's good in that you can use off-the-shelf touch screens. It's bad because it uses all of your GPIO pins. So no I squared C, no UART, no SPI, only six plain vanilla GPIO pins. All right, so for the gentleman who has the RetroPie in the white shirt, yeah, you, you, don't pass it. <laughs> ba back, back, back. Yes. Okay, do you, you have a sticker yet? No, okay, no sticker. How many buttons are on the, on the RetroPie? <laughs> how, many how many buttons? are on the controller. Count them. How many? Four. 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 Okay, so also there's a directional pad, right? The, yeah, yeah, yeah. So each direction counts as one button because when you press up, that's one button. Left is one button. Eight, very good, sticker. <laughs> okay, so this is a, a standard, this is the, the NES controller, not the Famicom controller. Uh, but there's A, B, select start, and then um, four directional arrows that you need. So we have six GPIO pins, and we have eight buttons. So that's, that's, that's a problem. 
So you guys remember what the message you get at the end of um, beating the first world of Mario is? Yeah, very, very, very disappointing. Wrong castle. Try again. So this is this is how I felt when I realized that I didn't have enough buttons, or enough GPIO for all the buttons. So, does anyone have any ideas? How can you solve this problem? Oh. So how could you how could you control eight buttons with only six pins? Hmm. You have an idea? Maybe. Maybe. Okay. Well, there, there's a few different ways you can do this, but I I have a hack I did, and you don't you don't actually need the you can't you can't press the left and right buttons simultaneously because they're the opposite sides. Um, and you can't press up and down at the same time. So I wired the start button so when you press left and right, <coughs> sorry, when you press left and right, it acts as the start button, and vice versa. When you press um, up and down, it acts as select. Um, and a couple diodes here in the circuit so that when when you press left, you don't want you don't want the um, signal to go through and trigger right, and vice versa, right? So the diodes only let current flow in one direction; it limits the current flow. So this is a you know clever hack. There's some other ways you can do this as well, like um, your laptop has a keyboard in it, and there's not actually well, this is a U.S. keyboard, but Japanese, I think Japanese keyboards, yeah, even more keys, probably. Although that looks like a U.S. keyboard, too. <laughs> so there's, um, no, 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 that's Japanese, because you have the funky return, which is longer. Okay, so what they typically do on a keyboard is they don't have enough pins for the, enough p control pins for all the buttons. So they create a matrix with rows and columns. And they send a signal down the um, columns, and they scan the rows to see which rows are active. And this way, you can um, you can have more buttons with fewer fewer pins. But for this purpose, this is easier because you can just stick a couple diodes, and then you just use the six signals, and then check. Uh, this is the wiring for the Kippa board. Um, this is a little controller I made out of a breadboard. Um, just to try it out. Um, and then you just solder it to the kippa like this. I would recommend some heat shrink wrap so the wires don't touch. So inside of it there is heat shrink on the one I have. And then you have a finished electronics for this. So not too hard. Simple, simple electronics, a few buttons, and you have a working, almost working game controller. We need some software to run on it. So for the software, we're using a Java emulator called Half NES, which is an open source project written by Andrew Hoffman. He works for the University of California, Irvine, um, has done a great job with creating a very accurate emulator. And then you can use NetBeans, like we did earlier, to deploy on the Raspberry Pi. And then you're up and running with um, you know, Mario or your choice of game running on hardware. So small problem though is his original code base was optimized for desktops not for the arm processor so you only get six frames per second with the core code base so i spent a few weeks um inside of netbeans doing performance tuning so netbeans has a really nice profiler for doing performance tuning um, actually, speaking of IDEs, what, what IDE do you guys use? Let's see. So in the, in the back, um, black, what, what, what's your IDE? What IDE do you use for, for, for 
Eclipse. Okay, thank you. All right, sticker. Who, who else uses Eclipse? Oh, okay, very good. All right, so what 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 do other people use? Uh, uh. Yeah, you can you can recommend something better. Okay, so who who doesn't have a sticker? Who who uses something else? How about in the in the back right? You use Eclipse? You yeah, yeah. Oh, Android Studio, which is IntelliJ based, right? Yeah, okay. So sticker for him too. Yeah. Oh, you got one already. Well, okay. So that's fine. You can have another one. Um, who doesn't have a sticker? Uh, do you have a sticker yet? Which ID do you use? Blue. Blue shirt and glasses. What's your ID? IntelliJ. Okay, so another IntelliJ user. <laughs> but so what? What is what is the official Sebastian recommendation on IDEs? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you'll 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 accept either, yeah. but not Eclipse. Not Eclipse yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, Sebastian and I tend to agree on that. <laughs> okay, so um, NetBeans has a really good profiler. Highly recommended. Here are some of the things I improved on it. I replaced Swing Video. Uh, who said they used applets? Somebody said they used applets. Applets. Yeah, yeah. What, what do you develop for your applet UI? What user? What UI technology? Swing. Swing. Okay, like that. Yes. Have you tried JavaFX? Oh, not yet. Okay. So I originally the half NES code was all written in Swing. And I replaced it with JavaFX for um, doing the graphic splitting. And this helped performance quite a bit because JavaFX supports 3D acceleration. So the Raspberry Pi, most desktops have good GPUs, but the Raspberry Pi also has a really good GPU. Um, so it's a uh, uh, video core. I think it's a video core based GPU in the Raspberry Pi. Um, so JavaFX gets graphics acceleration from that. And also, it doesn't require that you go through X Windows or a window manager. You can go directly to the frame buffer on the Raspberry Pi. And so that bypasses an extra layer and gives you additional performance. So this is this alone is probably three to four times faster, just changing the graphics toolkit. Um, I also modified to go to a per line rather than a per pixel rendering, so it's slightly less accurate but less synchronization points, so it works faster. Um, I replaced a bunch of bitwise helper functions with bit mask operations. There were bit, bit helper functions, which were called every time you were setting and getting the memory addresses for the game carts, and that was very slow. Um, I extracted some PPU operations out, rather than happening once per pixel or per line, happening once per frame. Replace some APU double math with longs. Um, the audio processing unit was using some double logic, but longs were accurate enough for it to work. Um, does anyone know what unsafe is? Hmm. Unsafe. OK, good. Don't use it. <laughs> the unsafe classes are um, they're they're designed so you can do things internally in the JVM, so the compiler team uses it quite a bit. It's not meant to be a public API. And if you do use the unsafe class, then um, in a future version, it might break. So for example, Java 9 might break some of the unsafe features. Um, I was trying to use it for array access to get rid of bounds checks, and it turns out it didn't actually help with performance because the just-in-time compiler is smart enough to optimize it. Um, this also didn't help replacing a loops with system array copy because there's an intrinsic, which automatically does that for you anyway. The last one was audio. So I modified the audio to, has everyone tried the gaming system? OK, so I'll tell you a pro tip. If you press select and start at the same time, you can switch games. So give it a try. Press select start, and then you can get to a menu, and you can switch games. 
Yeah, but press them, press them both. Ah. Oh. Yeah. Okay, so that's a little bit about performance optimization. So last topic, 3D printing. So who has a 3D printer? <laughs> Come on, if you if 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 you raise your hand, you're gonna have lots of friends. So when we were in um, Okayama, one of the one of the members who came for the meeting had a FlashForge 3D printer. And so he he has you know something like this. This is mine, which is a Ultimaker, uh, but it's very similar, and it takes. Um, a roll of plastic. In this case, it's um, I'm using PLA, which is a corn-based plastic, and then it sends it through this Bowden tube to the other end, which has a hot tip, which heats it up to 210 degrees Celsius, and then it extrudes and draws layers, um, so it builds it up very slowly, layer by layer. So it's not a very fast process. Um, it can take a few hours to print something, but you can do very fine detail. And it's very good for prototyping because you can design something on the computer, you can tell the printer to print it, and it's extremely accurate. And then you can try it out and test it and see how it works. Um, traditional like fabrication molds are they're more expensive, more time consuming. You have to send them out to get done. So this is a very good way of doing your prototyping at home. So next time you know you have a user group meetup. Maybe somebody can talk about their 3D printer, which they got. And then you'll have lots of friends, suddenly. <laughs> um, OK, so this is the software I used for doing the modeling called um, Autodesk Fusion 360. It's a commercial product, but they have a free license for students and for hobbyists. So if you're not making money, you can apply for the free license and use it. A lot of people in the hobby community use it because it's a professional package, so it's similar to SolidWorks or what people do for professional modeling. Um, and compared to some of the free software available, um, it's more powerful. So you specify the dimensions of very precisely for what you want to do. And within a very small tolerance, it will print out exactly what you specify in the dimensions. And then you specify extrusions and rounded edges um, and different operations on it. And later on, you can go back and you can modify the original dimensions, and it recalculates the model. So like during the course of this, I did a bunch of things. Like I changed the wall thickness to make it thicker, to make it sturdier. Um, I changed the alignment of components so it would fit in better. Um, this is where the speaker goes. And I had a new speaker, which the original speaker is no longer sold by Adafruit, and they sent me a new version, which was slightly different shaped. So I modified the case to make it fit the new speaker design. So I think it's it's very good to use a software like this, because you can later on go and modify the model instead of rebuilding it from scratch. Um, this is the hinge design. So I designed everything to be printed out of plastic. There's no screws. There's no, no metal hinges. It's all 100% plastic, except for the electronics. Um, but making a Hinge in plastic is very hard to do. Um, so my initial design was I did a 20-sided a um, polyhedron. And then when you rotate it, it would, it would snap at different angles wherever it um, fit perfectly. And so I gave this to my daughter. She's 13. Um, and had her test it. And she opened it and closed and opened and played with it a lot. And after about 50 times of opening and closing it, it was perfectly round. No, no hinge. <laughs> so it would, just, it would just flop around because there was no resistance. Um, so that, that was not a good hinge design. Oh, which game is this? Anyone know? Oh. OK, so this is Zelda 2. Adventure of Link. Did this come out in Japan with the same name or maybe not? Link? Adventure of Link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th this was a Japanese game, right? Yes. Yeah, okay. So here is my um, new hinge design. And this 
This was designed to take advantage of the fact that plastic can kind of flex. Do you have a sticker yet? Sticker? Oh, okay, good. What's what's this shape here? Triangle. Very good sticker. <laughs> so this is two triangles which are circumscribed inside of each other. Um, or they're cocentric. Um, so both circles are at around the same center point. And then um, there one one of the triangles is slightly bigger than the other. And it's it's very tiny, like this is the tolerance here between the two triangles. But what happens is since one triangle is bigger and one triangle is smaller, when you draw a line which connects the vertices, you end up with a slightly oblong triangle, like this shape. And so when you rotate it, it will... Um, it will um, have a little bit of friction until it gets 120 degrees, and then it it fits again. So every every 120 degrees, it, it will match. It will align perfectly. When it's 60 degrees off, you have overlap. You have a little bit of interference. And what happens is the plastic is going to stretch slightly to make room for the turning hinge. And then when you get back to a normal position, it'll bend back to the original shape. So this this motion with plastic, like stretching and returning to shape, um, it can do this many, many times without losing its shape, right? So unlike the sharp edges I tried with the polyhedron, this sort of design works well for plastic because plastic is a malleable material. It bends. Okay, so this is the software which called Cura, which is open source, which takes your 3D model and then generates the G-code for the printer for the instructions. Here's the printer printing out the bottom of the case. Uh, the first one was red. This is number two, which was green. Um, here you can see the completed parts for the top of the case. All right, so who, who doesn't have a sticker yet? Oh. How am I doing on stickers? Do you have a sticker? Uh, okay, how many parts are... <laughs> Is my head my head blocking apart? That's not. Oh, very good. Eleven. <laughs> okay, so this this seems easy, but um, I think you're the first person <laughs> who's gotten this right. <laughs> because whenever you ask somebody like a math problem, and they're presenting or they're like put on the spot, like that, it's it's very hard to do like math and counting and like those sort of um, things. So when you see like presenters like us get simple math wrong when we're presenting, it's not because we're stupid. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> but it's it's hard to do that sort of thing on the spot. So good job. Very good. Okay. So here's some pictures of the buttons being soldered. More buttons. Uh, Raspberry Pi in the bottom of the case. Um, this is the battery. The battery lasts about six and a half hours, which was my daughter's requirement to last a long car ride. Here is the um, power boost, which charges. It provides the micro, H micro, HD micro USB slot on the side, which then charges the battery and also powers the Raspberry Pi. Uh, here's the Kippa, which I mentioned earlier, to drive the display and the LCD cable. On top of this, you stick a couple spacers for the, the buttons the speakers and the remaining buttons. Um, here's the LCD connector cable, a little extension board so you can hook it up to the LCD screen. Um, in the side here, you have two pins, one on the left and one on the right, and they have little slots in them. And then on top, you push down a little locking pin to lock it in place. And then the screen fits on top of it and the screen keeps the locking pin from moving. So it's all designed like there's no screws or anything. Everything slides together in place. There's a couple places you have to remove material <laughs> when you're doing the 3D print. But other than this, you don't need supports. Just a little bit here and a little bit here so it, it prints better. And then you have, um, this is the top screen. It just kind of slides down on little channels. And there's a few pins here. And you just lift it and press it down to keep it. 
So on most of the things, the way I designed it is so there it fits together with two directions of motion, like sliding and then pushing in. And that way it won't come apart unless you you try to open it. But there's no screws or anything requiring it to um, to be open. And then there's the completed gaming system. Okay, so I have one final retro video game clip. What's this game? Oh, anyone play this? Metroid. Very good. Another sticker. No. Not another sticker. All right, so how are we doing on stickers? Does everyone have a sticker yet? Uh, all right, I think we're doing. How about in the very back? Did you get a sticker yet? Yeah, white shirt. Y you have a sticker? No, no. Okay, good. So, we just watched the ending to Metroid. What, what gender was the main character of the game? <laughs> I don't know. Oh my God. Okay. Here, I'll 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 give you a hint. Oh, oh. Okay. There's your hint. Woman, very good. Okay, so um, Metroid was one of the first video games which had a, a female main character. I mean, it's kind of cheating because it's in a spacesuit, so you can't tell you have a female character the whole time. But I think it's a good example. We should have more women in technology. So this is my daughter playing the RetroPie. She does helps me with kids' workshops. And so at like a young age, like elementary school and middle school, you have lots of, like I think in our workshops, we get about 50, 50, 40, 60 ratio of girls to boys. And then when kids get a little bit older, they get like high school, they get kind of stereotyped into, you know, programming as a guy's job and other things are a woman's job. So I think it's, it's good to encourage, especially your kids, but just in general, you know, the younger generation to, to not, stereotype careers by gender because I think it's a lot of fun doing programming, doing projects like this for anybody to try. So you can find out more about the project in the book, uh, Raspberry Pi with Java. We have two copies of the book to give away. Um, the way you get a book Yes. You answer a question, which we're gonna we're gonna come up with. So why don't you do your fir yours first? Well, Hold on. I will, I will ask a question. There you go. And if you have if you know the answer, you will get a book. <laughs> so of course I will answer a question from my presentation. So I hope you paid attention. So in my presentation and in my live coding, I used JuxRS, right? And I used a JuxRS component to create URIs with uh, information from your JuxRS projects. And specifically, I used one JuxRS mm -hmm. class provided by JuxRS to create the URIs. Can you tell me the name of the class? So one class which comes from JuxRS, I injected the class in my resource. And yeah, uh, maybe no. <laughs> Books uh, bookstore was the EJB. Yeah. Your eye info. Very good. All right. Please round give him a round of applause. You just won a book. So you have somebody who's who's good at math and programming. <laughs> All right. So for my question earlier in the presentation, remember I showed you guys this um, circuit. Where is it? Uh, this one. So it, the start button and the left and the right button are connected together. So when you press start, it simultaneously presses left and right. So this, this, is, this is good, right? But there's a situation where it doesn't actually work. So what combination of buttons, when you press them, will it won't give the right input to the game? And you mind? Repeating in Japanese. Yeah. 
make it a little bit easier. Yeah, but not not which game it doesn't work. Like, what's the combination of buttons to press? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Top and bottom. Um, okay, so the way it's designed, you can't, you can't press top and bottom at the same time. Like, the, the way the stick is designed, you can't physically push up and down at the same time, right? So, not, not quite right, but someone else want to try? Or you want to guess again? Yeah. Okay. Well, let you, you want to try, and then I'll give the question again. Right and top. No. <laughs> All right. So let me repeat the question. So um, the the start button. When you press the start button, it sends a signal that presses the left and right buttons at the same time, right? So Given this sort of setup, what combination of buttons, when you press them, it's not going to register in the game? Yeah? Very good. Yes. All right. So give them a round of applause. OK. And just to explain, if you press start and right at the same time, what what's going to happen is you you only you only have you know these pins for left and right. So when you press start, that means left and right both are triggered, and when you press right, the same pin right is triggered. So the the game will see start, it won't see the right. And same thing, if you do start and left, same thing. Start and left at the same time, the game sees start. And it, it, it doesn't, we, you, don't, you can't give it a left signal because you can't individually identify left is pressed. Um, so most of the time this doesn't matter because most games don't require you to press start, select, and then use the arrow at the same time. Except for um, Mike Tyson's punch out. <laughs> I think start is uppercut. And then if you hold, if you're pressing start and dodging, you can't do it at the same time. So it messes it up. Okay, so thank you guys very much for coming to the presentations tonight. And I will let Ido-san give the final um, last words. This is the first fifth course. I lost track. あ、もう何回目だか忘れちゃいましたけども、えっと、日本をえ、ずっと回って、え、福岡回って、広島で今日は大阪にお邪魔してます。だから5回目か、5回目ですね。えっと、全国11カ所ぐらい回る予定になって
、えー、もう皆さんよくご存知だと思いますけど、今、あのスクリーンの方に、えー、日本ラクルの方で提供している Java の情報を、えー、書いてあります。OTN Japan のホームページから、えー、Java マガジン、それから、えー、Java, Europa, Java デベロッパーニュースレター、えー、メールニュースですね。それからまあ、よくお使いだと思いますけど、JavaSE のドキュメント、それとえソフトウェアダウンロード、ぜひこれからもご活用いただきたいと思います。で、今日やったセミナーはですね、nighthacking.com のサイトにも上がってますし、来週の JJAGCCC でも、スティーブのセッションをもう一回やります。あと、えっと、ジャバデー東京24日のジャバデー東京もえと2人とも同じセッションですね。えー、とセバスチャンのやつはもうそのままセッションでやりますし、あとナイトセッションでもう1回えと今のレトロパイのセッションをやりますので、どうぞお楽しみにしてください。えー、ということで、わざわざ今日あのお越しをいただいているえスティーブとえーセバスチャンにちょっとえ拍手を、お礼の拍手をお願いできればと思います。Thank you so much.